All right, good evening, and uh, I want to start by thanking Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton for driving you guys to science for an evening and getting away from the circus that's out of the, outside of these walls. I know many of you came here or were signed up to come here to see Pierce Sellers, and I also know that Many of you by now know that he's quite ill, battling cancer, and his battle is continuing tonight. I was already planning to introduce Piers tonight, so instead, I'd like to spend at least the first five minutes or so of my time with you uh, telling you a bit about this man as I know him and demonstrating how he inspires us as global ecologists as well as the science community and citizens. This is Piers. Piers is most widely known as a veteran NASA astronaut. Three space shuttle missions and six EVAs, or spacewalks, in service to the International Space Station, to NASA, and to our country. What many, what many people have only recently come to understand is that Piers is also a global ecologist and a climate scientist. That's where he started in his career, and that's where he carries on today. The astronaut gig was a childhood dream that ended up being about a 14-year sabbatical from his uh, regular science duties. Today, he's serving at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center <clears throat> and in one of the coolest roles as the uh, Deputy Director of Sciences and Exploration. To my knowledge, as far as I know, Piers is the only person we can call a space-born climate scientist, uh, and that has gained him both a unique perspective on the state of our planet and an audience. He's, he's very good at communicating his deep scientific knowledge of the Earth system from the perspective of someone who's observed it best. And he does so with clarity, with accuracy, with humility, and with humor, especially with humor. Instead of describing his view of Earth, I thought it'd be best to play an audio clip of an interview he did with Kevin Kaners earlier this year. Listen to this. Maybe we won't listen to this. Let's try that again. In the back. It did, yeah. Let's give him a minute. It's about an, a minute and a half of him describing what it's like to be floating as an astronaut. That's him. That really is him. And he does it so eloquently. I want you to take a note to uh, find a recording. You can Google the elephant Piers Sellers, and you will uh, find this recording. Here's, here comes our technical. I got it from here. I got it. So uh, please do find that recording. And he talks about what it's like floating over Earth. Earth in a, a standard EVA, he's going through three day and three night cycles. And one of the most profound moments in his description is when he describes what it's like as an astronaut to see the sunrise and the thin blue uh, veil of our atmosphere against a black earth and the blackness of space. And that, to me, hit home as a global ecologist because that, of course, again, emphasizes just how thin the film of life really is here. The atmosphere is, of course, much taller vertically than, than the biosphere is at the bottom. You don't even see the biosphere there. 
And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Before I move on, I just want to say that peers had a huge effect on me as a graduate student. In 1995, I got a chance to do an internship at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I showed up. I wanted a chance to meet him. They sent me down to his office. I nervously knocked on the door. I went in. I introduced myself. He smiled. And we chatted briefly about my plans and nothing about him. And then all of a sudden he said, well, Greg, I have to go, and with a British accent. And uh, off he went, and he, I thanked him, and he handed me a gift, a used NASA mug. And 21 years later, that mug is the only mug that sits in my laboratory at Carnegie Global Ecology. His real impact on me was not inked really in that moment. It's like many, it's, it's really through the stories of his work and his leadership throughout our very small, tight-knit global ecology community. Along the way, Piers has been an inspiration to me and so many others, and I just wanted to thank him publicly. Okay. Lots of technical up here. Okay. Good. Tonight, I'm going to shift gears and uh, talk to you about some different aspects of exploring and managing Earth with a bit of an emphasis on managing Earth. And I always start with my soapbox statement, and that is our ability to measure and visualize environmental change at large scales yet with sufficient and actionable detail, and we'll talk about what that is, is key to managing Earth. It's key to managing Earth. And you might say, manage Earth? Really? Well, we're already managing Earth. We manage our water. We manage fire. We manage our animal populations from er the areas, a small protected area to the size of the Serengeti. And so we're already grappling, struggling to manage Earth. And of course, we're managing Earth at the grandest scale, the Paris Agreement, a uh, long time in the making, and it represents our effort as a science community, as a policy community, as a, as a, global, uh, uh, a global society to try to reduce our impact on the atmosphere today and in the future to try to turn the ship, Spaceship Earth, from its trajectory of increased temperatures by reducing our carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. So we're already managing Earth, we're just doing it rather poorly. Tonight I'm going to talk about forests. I work on forests, I work in savannas, I work with plants, I work with animals. Because I only have 40 or 45 minutes, I reduce it just down to forests tonight. And uh, forests are important. Uh, they're 30% of the global land surface. About 300 million people live in forests, but about 7 billion of us are very affected by the health and state of our forests. Whether you know it or not, uh, the hydrological system or water cycle, from scales of New York City and the Catskill Mountains, that's the watershed that's managed for New York City or where I live in California, the Sierra Nevada range. All the way up to the global scale, the hydrology is quite important, and it's heavily mediated by forests. Forests, of course, store carbon in their tissues, in their wood in particular. And by doing that, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and they happen to produce oxygen as well. And forests are the home of millions and millions of species. You take the forest canopy away, you take all the species that inhabit those kinds of ecosystems away. Studying and understanding forests in the context of managing them better at the Earth scale is very challenging. Uh, here are two examples of what I mean by that. We have the challenge of what I call scale and detail, just like my opening statement. Scale, like you see here, these are deforestation. Well, there's a forest image on the left, 1975 from Landsat, and again in 92, the same area. And many of you have seen this, deforestation. Or you can work in a tropical forest. If you squint, you'll see one of my guys climbing a tree there. 
very hard to get a picture of what's going on when you're actually in the forest. Very hard. And this has been the state of the art. Well, this for a long time, as Matt said, mentioned, and this since about 1972. When it comes to deforestation, uh, if you go to the early days, that would be pre-2008. That's, that's early days in tech, science and technology nowadays. Uh, there were only a few labs like mine who were actively able to take a satellite image like that in red. The red is where forest is, brown is deforested, and look again and see a change. Oh, excellent. This is, this is what I'm used to, don't worry about it. Everybody just take a... <laughs> okay, this is not what I'm used to. Um, so yeah, labs like mine were the, were the few that could... Ta-da! Could look at these images, and then by mid-2000s, the Brazilian government was the first federal government on earth that was actually monitoring its forests actively. And they get a lot of credit for being the first. Well, that's 2008. 2016, deforestation or forest cover change monitoring is absolutely routine. This is Global Forest Watch's example. Purples are where forest cover is changing. That's literally whether there's just a tree present or not. And there's a big constellation of uh, nano or small sats that's going up. It's mostly up now called Planet, appropriately named. Uh, I'm working with these guys and by early 2017 it will be creating a complete coverage of the earth or the terrestrial part of the earth every day. Every day. Like getting Google Earth update every day. So forest cover has come a long way in a quick, very short amount of time. What I want to talk about is going from the basics of forest cover because when it comes down to it, what we've learned is that knowing a forest is there or not actually doesn't help you address those three big issues I talked about very well. Hydrology, carbon, and, and, cl and thus climate change, and biodiversity. You really want to know more about a forest than just that it's there or not. For example, we want to know something about forest biomass. How heavy is the forest? A synonym here is carbon. You might hear those synonymously, biomass and carbon. Rather than looking down and knowing that there is forest, actually the trees vary in height. This is basic stuff, really, but hard to measure from space or from the air and how heavy those trees get. Even harder is to know something about the composition in terms of the species that are there. I like this image because the different species in this landscape are turning fall colors at different times, so you kind of get a sense for the different species that are in the canopy. Very hard to figure out and to utilize, but we need to know it. As Matt mentioned, uh, I direct the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. It's this beautiful Dernier 228 aircraft uh, that has been tricked out, as some people say. Uh, it has, instead of having uh, rows of seats for passengers, it has a laboratory that my engineers built I have fabulous engineers that do incredible work. And uh, it's a laboratory. You see desks. You see very high-end computing. And in the far back, you see something that we affectionately call the big gold sensor. Here's a view looking aft forward. And this is the sensor bay in the back. The sensor bay is comprised of three instruments, gold, white, and red. I won't go into them in detail, but they are looking out of the bottom of the plane. And one of the instruments images the land as we fly over in 3D. And it's using lasers to do that, firing those lasers at 500,000 times per second as we fly. Every laser beam is accounted for, where it went, when it came back, what it interacted with, and literally imaging the forest landscape as you see in the blue on the bottom there. And that's an actual cross section of this flight line. It's more fun to look at it this way. Extreme detail, leaf level, branch level detail. This is a lowland Amazon forest, as you would experience it as an eagle, or a monkey on a bad day, or whatever you'd call it. Uh, this, is th this was taken at 7,000 feet, but once we image it in 3D, we can fly through it and experience it just like the rest of the biology. 
that's not enough. So we have another sensor, which is actually our keystone sensor, sensor, the big gold sensor. This is about as technical as my talks get, but I have to show something in case somebody's out there who wants to know, what does the big gold sensor measure? It measures the fine interaction of sunlight with the land surface, in this case, the vegetation, and it measures the molecular bending, stretching, vibration, and rotation, the, the, those four types of movement of the molecules in the vegetation, and how they move, how they bend, rotate, stretch, and vibrate under sunlight is depicted in this squiggle known as a spectrum across the, the wavelength region from the visible on the far left to the near infrared on the, on the far right. And the different peaks and valleys tell us about the chemistry in, inside those molecules. Whether it's water content, I'll talk about that, or carbon, or nutrients, or whatever it is. And I've spent most of my career perfecting the measurement and the interpretation of this spectrum. What that does is it allows us to go from a 3D image, this is a single, a small two acre area in the Amazon, it's colored by height from the lasers, converted now to the chemistry of the trees. And this turns out, in, through a series of discoveries that I'll end the talk on, that these different colors are different species. Or we can just look at Stanford with the airplane. I put this up to give you more visual calibration of what the heck I'm talking about. There's Hoover Tower, there's the main quad, if anybody knows this area. But it's not just a 3D image with color, that would be too easy. It has that deep spectroscopic information. That's shown here. There's the Stanford campus in the image, and there's this Z direction going into the screen of, the, of this information from the spectrum. And we can pull out, like a library, any of these parts of this Z direction and understand the height of the objects, aspects of the coloring, and even the chemical composition. And that's what makes CAO so unique. Nobody is, doing that. Nobody is doing that on Earth today except us. Or you can just look at the Golden Gate Bridge. It's, it generates beautiful art as well. This is about a two-second overflight. Once you image it in 3D, you can walk and go under the bridge. You can do whatever you want with it. It sounds fancy, and it's, it sounds like we, poof, made this thing. But actually, it's been a long time in the, in the development. Matt mentioned that as well. Uh, it's really cool to be here because November 2016, right now, is our 10th anniversary of CAO. So this is a special, special time for me to be talking to you. But we started early on with NASA partners who we maintain today. I used to get to use this cool converted U-2 spy plane. Uh, it's called an ER-2. And we developed through these early days the basic physics of how to do this. There was a point where I realized that NASA's goals and my goals were not the same. I wanted to do applied projects that had direct conservation and management application. So I broke off and I had to endure this crummy little Piper Navajo with uh, single PI funds, no more government funding, and, uh, and started unwrapping and unfolding these kinds of measurements in an applied way. And those maps are Western Amazon, South Africa, and Madagascar. Those are places that I was able to go and and work on this kind of imaging for the purposes shown in the list there. And we, we started to grow our applications. Here we are, uh, we built CAO2 on the top and CAO3 on the bottom. And our list not only got longer of applications of this technology, but more mature. You can see the style of the, the terminology almost changing up to social science applications, coral reef health and bleaching, all kinds of things that I can't talk to you tonight about because there's not enough time. So we can congratulate ourselves with a beer. Thank you. Or we can really focus on what drives us to make this technology. And it's shown on the patch on, that, on Sheldon's arm on the far left. And I'll just zoom into that patch. It's, it has deep meaning for us, so much so that we wear it on our arm. Discovery, conservation, and action. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we've used this technology in those realms. First of all, discovery to generate action. Sometimes you don't plan for this. You're out doing science and something happens and you're, you're there at the right time or the wrong time, depending on how you look at it. And your science can generate action. 
Uh, let's look at this graph. Here's a graph of gold prices, gold on the market. And notice how the graph around 2005 takes a, a steep climb and the price of gold skyrocketed. What happened was there was a gold rush in the Amazon basin and it ended up generating landscapes like this. This used to be tropical forest. And in just days, the, these areas are converted. And I've been in these places. I do a lot of field work. And I'm probably one of the few scientists who've actually been in this kind of environment. It's horrendous what happens. The gold mining not only destroys the environment, it destroys lives. It causes prostitution. Uh, it causes, uh, basically, slavery. Uh, and it generates huge amounts of waste that's laden with mercury. I happened to be in the region at the time, flying over, and shockingly, nobody was really mapping this. There was a little bit out there in the science literature, but just not enough. We were there at the, I guess, the right place at the right time, if you want to think of it that way. And we mapped it, and we generated a lot of social uh, awareness of this problem. But our technology took it much further. This is flying over a gold mine. The red is sus suspended sediment with mercury in it. The redder the color, the worse it is. Blue is forest, so I have the colors from the spectrometer set so that we, we really make the mercury-laden sediment uh, shine. You could even go on a trip down the Amazon, many different rivers, and you're going to experience it like this. But what's really happening in a lot of places is that the gold mining is occurring hidden off the river bank. On the left is a uh, forested area that we imaged, and we deforest it digitally back in the lab and reveal these gold mining pits set back from the river. So the gold miners are smart. They know how to do it. They know how to get away from the river so that the tourists don't see it. And literally, there's tourism occurring right on the same, same patch of land. One of the worst things about it is the, the, the sediment with the mercury will get down the river. And this is a CAO 3D image showing the sediment load mixing with other rivers. And it actually has an effect on communities far down from the gold mining source. We reported this and worked heavily with the Peruvian Ministry of Environment at the time. This is kind of a blinding set of uh, news articles that led to that and enforcement that led to uh, effort to remove a lot of these miners. Unfortunately, they did remove a lot of them. It's like whack-a-mole, more came in. And so they continue to battle. That's an, ex that's an example of science that, or discovery that generates action. Mapping to fight climate change. Everybody knows that tropical forests are under extreme pressure. The Brazilian rate of deforestation has actually decreased in the last, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years now while it's increased nearly everywhere else. This is a typical scene of a, a average fire caused by clearing for uh, cattle ranches and oil palm in this case. One of the great policy efforts has been to utilize forests not only to save, concert, to, to save biodiversity, but to get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and back into these forests. These have names like RED for you experts out there, reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. But generally, there's this body of conservation or carbon conservation effort that's going on to pay people to nation to nation. You know the Norwegians are doing this quite a lot. Or even the state of California, where I live, we voted to pursue this as an option to reduce our net carbon emissions by investing in forest carbon. But to do that, you have to be able to measure it. And that's been a kind of a stumbling block along the way. We've developed science technology with the CAO that can take a single pass. This is a, a, a two-page spread from, I think, from uh, National Geographic in 2011. So this is with CAO2. And uh, image the forest, the forest quickly in its height and its biomass. Red are trees that are heavier and taller. Blue uh, is deforested area. And you can see it kind of tagged out here nicely with what the different features of the landscape are. <clears throat> we apply this now to, it's standard, it's operational. This is not research. We apply it to whole countries like Peru here. 
And this allows, critically, it allows the decision makers to come to the table and discuss where the carbon is. Red is car high carbon, blue is deforested land. Blue on this far left are the Andes where there's not so much forest, any, uh, not so much natural forest, and so forth. You can go to Panama and do the same thing. We're filling in these countries as we go. The outcome of this is like a balance sheet. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an assessment of the country's forest carbon, red, high again, blue, low, and then you can overlay all of the different human interests and you can work the balance, government to government or jurisdiction to juris jurisdiction inside the, the government. And this is where a lot of the work has gone on. And it has generated, for example, support for the $350 million that the Peruvian government received to sequester carbon in its forests. And we are very much a part of that process. Nowadays, uh, forest carbon is kind of transitioning from research, like I said, to operational at the airborne level. And we're just on the cusp of two missions that will bring forest carbon global. One is called, appropriately, JEDI. It uses lasers. It stands for Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, and it will be on the, space, uh, in the, on the uh, International Space Station. That's a US-led project, NASA. And then there's a competing project, which is good. We want a couple of options. This one is run out of Airbus, as in the, the aircraft company, to put up what's called a P-band radar, which is a radar that's very sensitive to biomass. So we're going global now with carbon. Managing forests in the context of climate change is altogether even, it's just much harder. We can try to sequester carbon in forests, but what about the changing climate on our forests today? California is a great case in point. I've been working in, I've been living in California since I got my job at Carnegie, which is getting to be a while ago now, I think 16 or 17 years ago. But the drought in the last five to six years has been enormous and has changed the face of California. Everybody thinks of reservoirs and fire like this, but really we haven't known the fate of our forests in the context of the ongoing drought, which actually we might still have drought, by the way, just because we got some rain this year isn't necessarily telling us that we're out of drought. But really, what is the condition of our forests as forest managers need to know? So we use this spectrum again, and I just put a box around a critical part of it that shows us that we can fly over and measure how much water is in the tree canopy. And what better way to know how a tree is doing than to understand that whether it has a lot of water or not so much water. It's kind of like getting a blood test, seeing how you're doing physiologically. So we fly over a place like this that looks just fine and green, a day that it wasn't so smoky, but deep in the drought, 2015, and actually, the yellow colors show trees that are drought stressed. These are uh, redwoods, coastal redwoods. So the landscape of green is not green. Yellow is drought stressed. Green is lots of water in those canopies. Notice how the drought stressed trees are a little higher elevation and on slopes where the soil moisture would maybe be lost a little earlier in the drought. And this tells managers where to apply, for example, in this case, fire protection. And that's a key because that's invisible to the naked eye. Here's Sequoia National Park, a place I work quite a lot nowadays. It is on fire in this image. Uh, that's, uh, if you look in the top, August 2015. Flyover looks kind of gray green. It has areas of severe drought stress in its tree canopies. And this was very useful to managers because it allowed them to do fire breaks and prescribe fires and try to isolate areas that look like they're basically goners. That's been a big part of the project. Finally, I want to end, uh, I want to really put emphasis in this talk on technology to break what I call the biodiversity barrier. What is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the fabric of all the species that, and their interactions in the biosphere. I think of it as a fabric, it's woven together. Those species depend on each other as predator and prey, as parasite and host, whatever it is, there's a fabric that's created among species and we call that biodiversity. Very ironically, we're at, we are today, in my 
not so humble opinion because I do this for a living. It's, it's an educated opinion. Uh, completely unprepared to manage Earth during this, what's called the sixth extinction. Everybody knows Eliz Elizabeth Colbert's work, great book. I was actually inspired by the first version of this book by Richard Leakey in 1996. This is one of the people that brought me into global ecology just by reading him. Both of them are incredibly important works. It's not hyperbole. We are in severe, severe loss mode right now. If you didn't see, CNN last week had uh, an article that said, by 2020, compared to 1970, we will lose two-thirds of all wildlife. Two-thirds. And this, this graphic depicts some of the loss in red relative to the whole pool of tree species and fish species and, and whatever else is up there. If you, this is a little bit of science, and I'm sorry this is technical, but I want to make a point that's super critical here. If you look at forests, or if you look at the entire plant, terrestrial part of the planet, the land, and you average it latitudinally, that's the x-axis here. So at zero, that's the equator. And let's look first at the black line. The black line is the distribution of trees and shrubs or woody vegetation averaged up or summed up from around the globe by latitude. And look at where the two peaks are. The peaks are one around zero, that's the equatorial, the great equatorial forest of the Amazon, the Congo, Southeast Asia. And then there's another peak uh, around 60 degrees north of the great uh, boreal forest, that's uh, Russia's forest, Canadian forest, Alaska, and so forth, northern, northern Europe. And then the blue line is where the carbon is, if you're interested in carbon. It follows the forests appropriately. The red lines or orange lines are where the global compilation of field measurements are. Anyone else see what I see? The field measurements are focused on places, we're at about 40 north here in Washington, D.C. They're focused in Washington, D.C. No, they're, 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 they're focused in northern, like U.S., parts of Europe, and so forth. The actual knowledge about where the carbon is is coming from the wrong set of measurements. So the space missions are really critical for this. If you look at biodiversity, our situation is even more dire. Here's the same axis, basically, southern latitudes on the left, northern latitudes on the right. The blue boxes are our best community estimate, community of scientists, estimate of how, where the species are, how many species there are. This is all species. And look where the peaks are. Of course, they're around the equator and a little north of the equator, and then they taper off because it's colder, shorter days, and so forth in the, at the extremes. But our, our actual measurements, our inventories, the herbarium at such and such a museum, and or at such and such a museum, are pretty evenly distributed and with only a few bit of peaking in the, in the uh, equatorial zone. So the gap between the blue and the white is extreme and biggest in the, in the equatorial zone. That's the state of our knowledge of biodiversity today, at least in the biogeographic sense. So what we've done, my colleague, Dr. Robin Martin's here, uh, what we've done with her and with a team is to develop try to develop a totally new way of measuring biodiversity. This is 10 years old as well. Everything's 10 years old in my lab for some reason. Uh, this has been funded very consistently by the MacArthur Foundation, so I want to call them out, taking risk on me to, to make this happen. And it's a field program of tree climbing, la high-end analytical laboratory work, and a, an enormous archive of species now of the world, tropical uh, uh, forest species. And today, there's some facts about it. We have about half of all known tree species on Earth in this archive. We have more than 3.5 million samples. And critically, what do the samples do? We've used them to connect this spectral information that I told you about with the taxonomic information and with the chemical information that translate species to chemistry to spectral. The chemistry is the great translator between the two. And that just shows you the, the, the distribution of our field program. What that's done, skipping 
many, many steps, is to convert a, a landscape that you might fly over in 3D like this, where you see tree, trees in green and you see some dead trees in brown, to the first views of the actual species composition, in this case of Sequoia National Park. Different colors are different species, and you see right away that different species inhabit different parts of the park. It's not random. It's not like fuzz on a, on a, computer, on a TV screen after you unplug it. It's, it's got pattern. That's called biogeography. We've applied this technology now, and I'm going to show for the first time ever a grand application of this. We've applied this technology to, uh, this is Peru. I turned it on its side. It's a little odd this way, but it fits the screen better. The, the, Atlant the Pacific is off to the, on the horizon. You see Lima all the way out there. This is Peru, and this down here is Brazil. And you see the border. <clears throat> and, I, and just to give you a sense for the size of this place, it is about 300 million acres, and it's a place where biodiversity on land is the highest on planet Earth. Hands down, it is not in Brazil per acre, it is in Peru. And one of the reasons it's so high is that it's where the Andes and the Amazon meet, and that great meeting place has generated species because of geologic and climatological factors that I won't go into right now. I'm happy to answer questions about that. Here's what it's like flying. With the CAO, we can go from the tree line, the montane, to the submontane, to the lowlands in a day and collect a lot of data. Two terabytes in a day, not bad. Uh, maybe uh, 500,000 acres in a day. And we can add that up. Let me first show you what biodiversity looks like when you fly over. This is the tree canopy flying over. This is taking the, the spectral data, converting it to chemistry, and then to species. Different colors are different species. And we have worked a decade to perfect this capability. And I would say that today, it's not research anymore. It's now operational for us. It's so operational, we can go back to Peru and do look at the whole country. I put here, and this is not to be flippant, I put here for my students that Google Earth is a great tool but it is an ecological lie by omission because it shows us that, no, oh, there's this green Amazon there. It's not true at all. Actually, there's this kaleidoscope of different types of ecosystems in that Amazon basin that just looks plain old green. These different colors are where the different communities of species change. Why is there a pattern? We figured it out. It's because of the geology that underlies the Amazon, the elevation, and other factors that have to do with how species interact with one another. We can take that, just like I talked about earlier, and do a kind of a, a, a check of how Peru is doing in terms of its protections of this biodiversity. This is that same map now properly displayed upright, north is up. And these white areas are the national parks and the other federal reserves in Peru. And we're working with the Ministry of Environment on this because they want to know are we protecting all of the different types of forests? And you can see right away the answer is no. There are lots of different colors or parts of this Amazon basin that are not in a white line inside a white polygon. And that is the first time this has been possible. This is basically a couple months old. And it allows us to, instead of just looking at the biodiversity of the planet from field data and then just saying forest or not forest, it lets us for the first time craft a map that tells us not only that there is forest there, it's colored, but what type of forest it is. Finally, I want to say something about talking to decision makers in public, in the public. How do you talk to them about saving biodiversity? People understand hydrology and water. People are starting to understand carbon. Biodiversity is tough. Unless you're a biologist, an ecologist, a naturalist like our president, you don't have an inherent knowledge of that biodiversity is not the same everywhere and that it's taken, well, 400 million years since the first land plants, uh, first plants occurred on land, that biodiversity is hard to explain. So we use a variety of tactical, aggressive tactics. Uh, one is we make art, or we have our colleagues make art. Two, we do fashion. Three, we bring the President of Columbia on board, or the Minister of, of Environment of Peru, 
and we teach students at all ages, and we try to hit the media as hard as we can. And it's through that process that people are starting to understand that the biodiversity of the planet is not only important, but it, that it's variable, beautiful, amazing, and worth save, saving for the future. Still, all of this is still region by region, and tonight I want to tell you about a new satellite mission that I'm deeply involved in with my partners at JPL and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And this is a mission specifically focused on the biodiversity of the planet using the technology and the science that we have perfected at Carnegie and CAO. We're working at the design phase now. That means we have all the ideas, we have the know-how, we know how to build the instruments, we know the science to put behind it. It's not funded by the US government today, but we have that package and we're presenting it to the US government. This is actually a rendering of what the satellite would look like. And it's only through this way, this approach, that we're gonna get a full understanding of the biodiversity of our planet today. And there's an urgent need to do that because the climate is shifting in different parts of the world already. I think people can sense it. As a climate scientist, we know it's happening. And so while it's shifting, the biodiversity is shifting with it. We want to get the measurements now so that we can track over time and make better decisions about how to protect and sustain it into the future as the climate shifts. Until then, uh, you'll see us flying, or maybe you won't see us flying because we're too high, but you'll hear about us flying, I hope. You'll uh, hopefully can visit our website and see what we're doing. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the people who have supported me and my team. Uh, I want to call out the top four. Uh, Jim Cameron's Avatar Alliance Foundation has been behind us. Will Hurst, foremost, has been behind us. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation took risk on me with this species mapping when I'm not sure I deserve the risk that was being taken. Uh, and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, who really brought Cal us into the California problem and how to do measurements that really affect on-the-ground management in real time. And then many others that I don't want to, uh, I, I want to make sure that you know have been really behind us along the way. And finally, I want to thank my team. We're small, but very, very potent. So thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions. Oh, is that right? Okay, I think it's worth uh, ending where I started. Pierce Sellers is uh, someone who I have followed and tried to follow in his footsteps <laughs> from a different angle as a, more of a biodiversity nut than, than a climate scientist. And I just heard that we could hear his recording. Are you going to play it or am I just doing it? Say again? Go around the world every 100 minutes. That means you have 45 minutes of day, 45 minutes of night on every orbit. And so when you're doing a spacewalk, you go in and out of three days and nights as you go around the world. So you're flying around the world at five miles per second, looking at this beautiful blue curved ball below you during the day side. During the night side, you see all the cities you know, glowing away down there like beautiful little jewels. Just, just lovely. As you come out of night in today, you get a warning from the guys inside the space station. They say, hey, you know, sunrise coming up, 60 seconds. Check your visors, because you want to flip down your gold visor that keeps out the sunlight. So you flip that down, you turn off your headlights, and I'm not kidding, you see on the horizon just the tiniest thin blue sliver in the blackness. Just a blue, blue sliver. And then suddenly the sun comes up. Bam! It's like a nuclear bomb or something. It's just this great white explosion on the horizon. And it starts climbing into a black sky in front of you. And it's going so fast that you can see it move. You can see all the shadows on the space station move. At the same time, a new day is sort of peeling towards you. 
from the horizon towards you, you see the world unfold again and roll towards you. Big blue oceans and clouds and things. Just staggering. It's a, re a real God's eye view. That's what I wanted you to hear. Time for questions or? Okay, great. Hi, you showed your graph, which I believe you said was molecular responses to sunlight. And then there was also the topic of the species identification yes. based on the chemistry. Yes. When and where are your two lectures explaining those two topics? <laughs> great question. Uh, so it, in 2006, it was Robin Martin and I who were on a mountain in, on Kauai called Limahuli Valley, and we were frustrated because we had been taught that tree canopies had a certain kind of chemical makeup and that we should expect it. And we were collecting, climbing trees and collecting these plants and doing the chemical analysis, and we found that, no, this, this is not working out the way the textbooks told us. The different species were showing signs of different chemical traits, as we call them. Kind of like we have different traits that identify us. It turns out that 10 years later, we developed an understanding through the program called spectronomics. I failed to say that earlier. It's, it's a word that we invented that links quantitatively the, the taxa or the species with their chemical signatures. Not one chemical, not two, but a series of chemicals like you sign your name. And it turned out critically that that related to the way that the foliage in the canopies reflected sunlight spectrally. That discovery is probably our greatest discovery because it's fundamental, but it leads in the application side to an ability to map not only the chemistry of plants, but the species composition. The rest, you'll have to come to Stanford and hang out in my lab. I could use a few volunteers. I was wondering, with all of this data that you're getting in, you know, terabytes and petabytes of data, is that a problem to deal with all of that? Yes. <laughs> the first thing that happened when I took that little Piper Navajo up, this junky little spectrometer that we got in there and got it to work, and the data came fl fl you know, flowing out. I got it back to Stanford, and one of my guys who's been with me for a long time looked at me and said, we're going to need a bigger computer. And uh, we've built up and built up and built up. And uh, nowadays, Carnegie supports that building up of our computer capability. It's a challenge, but one of the great things is there's been this blossoming of data scientists. If you come to my lab, we have like the biologists and we have the, the remote sensing people and the data scientists that don't really care what the media, what the, the subject matter is. They care about how to compute it. And that's a huge area. Of course, Google has got lots of those people working for them. We're able to keep a few of those people and uh, make those uh, advances. But you're right, it's, it's a constant challenge and it's one that's increasing as we go. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, first of all, it was an absolutely beautiful talk and explained very clearly. It would be nice to hear more details about the science, but. Uh, two things. The plot you showed for a spectral signature was spectral radiance versus wavelength. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, I'm used to seeing it as reflectance. Yes. Apparent reflectance versus <coughs> wavelength for identification of materials. Yes. And always the challenge is how much can you back out of the atmosphere? Yes. Uh, due to the modeling. That's the first question. Okay. The second question is you showed avarice, which I did believe occurred earlier um, in 1995 or so, which did hyperspectral yep. mapping. Yep. Um, the signal-to-noise requirements there, they decided were in the thousands to one required to get at the features. Um, Aster, which is flying today as a space-based hyperspectral sensor, um, is a few hundred. Yeah. And one of the limitations that I understand is it, it has to do with the non-uniformity correction yeah. that is uh, in the two-dimensional rays which you need for the space systems. Yeah. Have yeah. you guys got a trick? Do you have a way to solve that now with new detectors? Yep. Um. <laughs> Thank you, and you know more than maybe other people know here. Um, 
Okay, first question was atmosphere. When we, when we fly over, we're, the spectrometer is not just seeing the land surface, but this column of atmosphere. And that is loaded with water vapor, aerosols, whether it's a volcanic aerosol, like when you fly in Hawaii, we have that problem, or sea, sea spray, sea salt based aerosol, whatever it is. The spectroscopy, if it's, I lost, there you are. The spectroscopy, if it's of high enough quality and in terms of its signal to noise and its definition in terms of uh, bandwidth, we can actually solve for some of the atmospheric constituents and the land surface as a single solution now. And that's an advance. Your, your question about radiance versus reflectance, we used to go radiance, then correct to reflectance, and then do our analysis. We still do that, but it's more in an, uh, a, a total ensemble solution. The question about uh, other instruments and what we've learned about what works and what doesn't work from orbit has been trial and error. You mentioned Avaris, that's the sister program to CAO, and the labs are very tight. That's why I had the logo up there to, to honor that relationship. Uh, through that process, we've learned that four types, four issues are needed to, to solve this, kind of get to this level of science. One is the signal to noise of the instrument. Is your signal strong enough compared to the noise that, that's inherent in cameras or spectrometers or whatever you're talking about. The second is uniformity. That's, do all the pixels across the image perform the same so that the image, a pixel over here and a pixel over here are comparable? The third is uh, stability. When you, when you fly today, is it gonna give the same kind of electro-optical electro performance as tomorrow? And, um, and there's a fourth, and now I just forgot. There's a fourth, it'll come to me. Though we've solved those issues by trial and error, working with our engineers, but it hasn't been like as if the theory led to the perfect product. It's been build, fly, find where, why you're not getting certain chemistries, rebuild, add and replace the detectors if needed, and so forth and so on. And this actually, I wanna use your question to make a point. This is why we need a satellite mission. This technology is not one where we're gonna where we are going to carbon copy these very easily. They take a lot of focus to make that big gold sensor perform like I showed. So why not build one really well, put it in orbit so everybody can use it? That's my goal. So I, I used your question to, to make a pitch. Yeah. To communicate your information to the public and leaders, mm. do you make the use of artists and visual communication specialists to guide you along? We, yes, when they come to us. <laughs> so, so we get some great artists and residence types who come. Uh, I showed the work of Adrian Colburn who took the la ideas of laser beams imaging for us and did this cool artwork that actually did quite well out there. Uh, the fashion one was Veja, French uh, clothing company. They came to me and said, you have some really cool images, can we have one? And like a dummy, I said, sure. I did, so they got a free image. We didn't really get much out of it other than that they got people wearing these shoes. But it's that form of people coming to us and us engaging them, or really me engaging them, trying to figure out ways to communicate step by step. What I lack that I would love input on is a more systematic way of making that kind of translation to art, to fashion, to whatever it is happen. We're busy scientists, so we wait for it to come. I think the problems we face are so severe, we need 10 times as many of you. <laughs> and um, I'm extraordinarily grateful that there are foundations, private foundations, that are willing to support you. But to get 10 times as many, we need federal support. We need government support. So what do you know about the conversations that might be going on to create for the planet the equivalent of the World Health Organization, which serves humans? <clears throat> But we humans are in trouble if we don't have a safe and healthy planet. Fair enough, and I like your shirt. It says science it rules. It says science rules. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't have a grand answer. I'm, I've been a cog in a big international effort. The climate change treaty that you know ended or culminated in the Paris Agreement is one expression of that. There's a, cons there's a biodiversity version of that that's ongoing. It's a hard nut to crack with biodiversity. I don't know what the insider conversations are. I really don't. What I know is that 
in the U.S., there's a body of scientists who are focused and advising at least the current administration for, and we'll see what happens next, on these kinds of missions, and this is the narrow niche that I fill, that will really advance our understanding of how the planet is changing, but not in a way that just backs off and observes and says, oh dear, we lost it, but allows us to turn the problems that we have into solutions by managing some of these problems at larger scales. Until we do that, we don't have any hope. We need to manage at larger scales. And these, these technologies are not the solution, but they are a critical pathway towards the solution. Hi, thank you so much for that talk, it was great. Um, I am not an expert. I had no idea what this guy was talking about. Um, but I love your talk, and um, <laughs> by the end of it, I, I wanted, I had the same feeling that I have every time I read one of those articles, um, and every time I learn about this kind of thing, which is I want to be able to do something. So you've got an army of, what, 350, 400 people here. Um, what would, how can we help? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, since you said you didn't know what was being talked about with the detectors and stuff, I'll say you're not a scientist, right? So for the non-scientists, yeah, okay. Nowadays, we all were told to think globally and act locally, and that's totally true. Don't ever give up on that. But now it's time for you to think globally and to be part of this communication between science and our policymakers. To be, you don't have to be a scientist, but to be knowledgeable enough about the criticality of these issues, water cycle, carbon cycle, biodiversity, to help us to talk and find the leadership that will bring some of these issues further down the road, and because we're dragging our feet, especially here in the US on some of these issues, we all know that. So that's where you're most effective. If you wanna be a scientist, call me. Uh, we'll figure out a way to get you into the lab and we'll grow you from there. That's all I can say about that. Excuse me, I don't have a question. I just would like, uh, I may speak for the audience. Please convey our best wishes to Pierce Sellers. Thank you. Absolutely.